Almighty God, we ask that your spirit would fill this room this morning, fill the rooms of every living room, watching online, every desk as people take a break from their work day to engage in this morning's service and of praise and glory and honor to you. Lord, let that spirit that fills us with life and gives us hope that we'll have life with you forever engender in our hearts thankfulness and praise and the fear and the awe of you. As we launch into a new fall, Lord, we ask that you would keep us safe, that you would protect us, that you would give us, Lord, an eagerness to come to your rail and to eat of the bread and drink of the wine that leads to everlasting life and to invite the world around us, Lord, to share this feast of joy and thanksgiving and eternal life with, with you. Now, Lord, this morning I pray that every word out of my mouth and the meditation of every heart in this room would be pleasing and acceptable to you as we cling to you, as we depend upon you as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So can any of you here recite Proverbs 9, 10? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's say all that together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10. I've been thinking about that verse all week. Uh, Eben started kindergarten this week. And the headmaster of his new school said something in his opening address that just had my wheels spinning all week. He said that he wanted to model for his students and he wanted his teachers and administrators to model for them what it means to be a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman so that all of the students would grow up to be God-fearers. Now, our culture bucks against the word fear. We are fiercely independent modern men and women, and whenever you talk about fear in the Lord, we think about ourselves as sinners in the hands of an angry and vengeful God. But what it actually means to live in the fear of the Lord is not about living in abject terror. Rather, it's about the simple recognition that God is awesome that he is holy, that we are ever walking in his sight, that he loves us with an everlasting love, that he gave his life for us on the cross, and that he desires that we might show forth his praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by walking before him in holiness and righteousness all our days. So fear is not about quaking, but rather about being overwhelmed with awe over the power and the might and the grace and the love of God. And in response to the awesomeness of God, that sense of holy fear inside of us, we should want to do every single thing that we do in our lives for the sake of his glory. And if this is how we live, full of the fear of the Lord, then we will be God-fearers. And I, for one, want no other message on my tombstone than that. Here lies Andrew Michael Rowell, a God-fearing man. Amen. Today is what we call the Festival of Christ Church. And I know it's not on anybody else's liturgical calendar. There's no colic for this day or special readings for us. We use the colic that's set forth for a proper 15 today, and we... Just pick the passages from Scripture that are assigned for us to read. But we set this Sunday aside each year to kick off our fall programming and take a minute to recall our history and renew our commitment to the things we know God called us to when this Christ Church was founded. Now, Christ Church is only 16 years old, so I like to say that there are no old-timers in a 16-year-old church. We really just now got our driver's licenses, right? But some of you are new enough to our life together that you don't know the hows and the whys of how we came to form Christ Church. 
And those of you who were here from the beginning could always use a reminder of what it was that God called us to from our inception. But the lens that I want us to keep in mind for this walk down memory lane this morning is that God wants Christ Church to be a community of God-fearing men and God-fearing women who have been called out of darkness into His glorious light and who will raise up generations after us to know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and that worshiping Him and serving Him are the highest purposes of human life. So here's a bit of our history. In 2005, the original members of this parish found themselves in a denomination that no longer feared the Lord. The leaders of the Episcopal Church had become assured of their own wisdom and proud in their own understanding. In the darkness of their minds, they began to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They began to deny that Jesus was the only way to salvation. They begin to corrupt the gift of human sexuality, to question the reasons why God made us as men and women, to actively undermine the authority of Holy Scripture, and to deny 2,000 years of the traditions of the church. And so with great courage and conviction in the fear and love of the Lord, Father John Michael Van Dyke and Father Rusty DeMoss and hundreds of other faithful Christians left and set forth into the wilderness of Montgomery. And that merry crew, many of whom are here today or watching online, they wandered from the Wilder's backyard to the Capitorium at St. James School to Dexter Avenue Methodist Church. And they found shelter under the faithful leadership of Anglican bishops from Rwanda and Uganda. And eventually, by God's grace, they found these 15 acres, and they gave generously from their resources to build this first phase of our lovely campus. And over the years, we have become a key parish in a brand new branch of the Anglican Communion, the Anglican Church in North America. And the Lord has added to our number hundreds of other faithful believers from different walks of life, different denominations, different backgrounds, all drawn to our rootedness in the ancient traditions of the church and our commitment to make worship about His glory and not about our entertainment. Today, I would say that we were founded by a community of God-fearers. We continue to add new God-fearers, and we seek to raise up new generations of God-fearers, men and women boys and girls, who live in the loving awe of our gracious God. Today's lessons from God's Word all speak to the richness of life that is available to those who fear the Lord and who are called according to His purposes. In Proverbs this morning, we're introduced to Lady Wisdom. She is the personification of the wisdom and the goodness of God. And today's lesson tells us that she builds a house and she prepares a feast and she sends out her serving women to invite the world to come to a meal with the creator God of the universe. It's an invitation to set aside self-created wisdom, to set aside pride, to set aside wayward confidence in our own ability to make our way in the world. Lady Wisdom invites us to become simple, to become like children, and to come eat of God's bread and drink of God's wine so that we might have true wisdom and true insight. Proverbs also introduces us to Lady Folly. She is the dark countervoice to that of Lady Wisdom. Lady Folly represents the wisdom of the world. Her serving girls are prostitutes who beckon us not to the feast of God, which is forever and priceless and life-giving, but to the junk food of the world, which is transitory and worthless and deadly. 
on this festival of Christ Church, we are reminded that God called us out so that we might build a parish based on his wisdom, that we might be about preparing his feast, and that we might invite ourselves to the grace of God and invite the world around us to leave folly behind. And if we will choose to chase after God's wisdom rather than after human folly, God's Spirit will open the eyes of our hearts to see that the highest goal of human existence are not to retire with millions or to visit every country or to win the football game. Those things are fine. But we know the truth, that the fullness of life can only be found in knowing God and being known by Him. The fullness of life can only be found when knowing God and being known by Him is the locus point around which all of our life revolves. And to know Him is to fear Him. To fear Him is to know Him to be the awesome God of love. To know Him and to fear Him is to serve Him with all of our time, all of our energy, all of our resources. Does that describe your life? Does it describe mine? Christ's church is here to make God-fearing men and God-fearing women and to raise up children to be God-fearers. May we all become just that. For the sake of His glory, amen. Our lesson from Paul's letter to the Ephesians also calls us to fear the Lord. Anyone who strives to live a life of purity in order to please the Lord is acting wisely and not foolishly. Now, let's be clear, Paul is not saying that we can be pure enough to deserve God's love for us. Rather, Paul is exhorting us to know that God has loved us with an everlasting love. And we don't want to respond to that grace in vain. But rather, we want to live lives of obedience to his commands, all out of thankfulness for what he has done for us in Jesus. Those who fear the Lord trust that his commands are for our good and not there to harm us. Those who fear the Lord obey him. They flee from sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, crude jokes, and the unfruitful works of darkness. Those who fear the Lord used to be darkness. You used to be tangibly, ontologically, in reality, you were darkness. But because of Jesus, you are now light. And those of us who fear the Lord seek to discern how to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. Throughout this reading from Ephesians, Paul calls us to live lives of transparency. Mercy do we need that in our lives right now. To speak always of the goodness of God and not of the folly of the world around us. To not pretend like we can claim an inheritance in the kingdom of God and live no differently than heathens. The last line of this reading, Thomas, is a line from an early Christian praise and worship song. We don't know the tune, but it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Christ's church was built to God's glory, to raise up God-fearing men and women and boys and girls who are not asleep, who are not dead in their sins, but are rather awake and alive in the shining light of God. So this morning, are you awake or are you asleep? What about me? May we all wake up and be wise in the holy fear of our mighty God. Amen? Amen. The gospel today reminds us that we built this Christ church not for ourselves, not just so that we would grow in the wisdom of the Lord, 
but rather that the world around us might know the saving news of Jesus Christ. Christ's church was not built for you. It was not built for me. It was not built so that we would have a church in our own image with music we like and preaching that soothes us or inspires us. Christ's church wasn't built to entertain us but so that we could have a pretty building in which our offspring could get married or a respectable place from which we could be buried. We built Christ's church so that we could be God-fearers who call the world around us to fear the Lord, for he's gracious and merciful to sinners who repent. And this church is built in the shape of a cross, and at the very center of it is this altar. And this altar reminds us always of this truth. Just as Lady Wisdom prepared a feast in our lesson from Proverbs and called the world to come eat the bread and the wine of the Lord, so too at this altar... Sunday after Sunday, the Lord prepares a feast. And it's not just for us. It's for the world. Jesus tells us in John's gospel today that if we share in his body and we share in his blood, if we eat the bread and drink the wine that he has given for the life of the world, then we will have life in us, eternal life. And that life is not for us to hoard It is designed for us to share as we invite those who are walking in darkness to be light, to live in the light of Christ. Christ Church is here to make God-fearing men, women, and children who kneel down here every Sunday in humility and have the greatest gift of God pressed into our palms and to be filled with His Spirit through that feast to go out into the world heeding his call to make disciples of all nations. May we do so. Amen? Amen. Say it with me one more time. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10. Verse 11 of our psalm today said almost the same thing. The Lord's delight is in those who fear him and put their trust in his mercy. I want to delight God. Don't you want to live a life that your heavenly Father delights over? He made us. He gave his life for us. He wants to feed me and you and show us mercy and bring us to everlasting life. And so to delight him, I need to be a God-fearing man who puts my trust in him and who feasts at his table Sunday after Sunday, kneeling down in awe that his goodness and grace would reach out even to me. This is the history of Christ church. For 16 years, broken men like me have knelt down at this rail Broken men and women like all of you have knelt down at this rail and had a chance to grow more fully into your role in the world as God-fearers. And I pray that that is true of our future. You know, as Eben walked out with the rest of his kindergarten class this week, off to become more and more, I pray, a God-fearing young man, I was a completely typical kindergarten parent, you know, full of tears, bursting with pride, and just struck with the pangs of love. I am so proud of him. I just adore him. And because I adore him, I discipline him so that he might live an upright life and live a life that delights the Lord. But no matter how he does with that, no matter how he lives, no matter how far away he might stray, my love for him will never change. It will always be unshakable. Now imagine how much more your heavenly father loves you than I love little Eben. I'm a broken, fallen human person. I can't love 
the way that God loves, God looks at you with the pangs of love. He wants to love you with that love that is more unshakable, more constant, more disciplining, more eternal than any love that you will ever know. I pray that you and I would respond to that love with fear, with awe, find wisdom in our fear and stand up for Jesus in this world because that's what he's called us to do. For he so loved you and he so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if we will believe in him and fear him and trust him and find our delight in delighting him, then we'll know everlasting life, not just in the world to come, but right now. Christ's church is here so that all those within its walls might become wise, might become light and not darkness, and that we might feast on Christ and invite the world to that feast where the God that we fear delights to shower us with his love and his grace. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and confess our faith in God using the words of the Nicene Creed.